Okay, great. So um, I'd like to continue um, with our discussion from last time. And uh, this time it's going to be, uh, everything we're going to talk about is really going to be geared towards applications. Um, last time I told you what uh, um, epsilon machine spectral reconstruction theory was, and we worked through some, some couple of, a couple of examples. And now I want to show you how we can use that formalism, we'll have to adapt it a little bit, to talk about structure and materials. And in particular, what I really, I guess the main theme I want to get across today, and I'll just state it out, state it out, 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 out loud so that, so, that, so, so that we don't miss it, is that there's a new way to think about structures and materials, that we're going to develop and use a formalism. We're going to show how to find these things from real specimens, from, from, from real little pieces of dirt, how we can describe both ordered and disordered crystals within the same formalism. This is really an incredibly fundamental problem. Uh, Bragg, uh, uh, the, the, the father and son team of Bragg, who won the Nobel Prize in 19, 19, 1915, uh, they, they started their work, I believe, in 1912, uh, they were trying to ask the question and, and trying to understand, you know, where are the atoms? If you have a bit of rock, you know, one of the most fundamental things you can ask is, what is it made of, and how are the things related to each other spatially inside this little piece of rock? And you can imagine that when you think about condensed matter systems, that the arrangement of the atoms within the, and I use the term crystal here loosely, not necessarily meaning something that's periodic as a strict, in a strict crystallographic sense, but something that could be disordered. But if you think about a, a, a crystal, uh, I lost my train of thought, uh, you want to know where the atoms are going to be, and you can imagine this has an incredible influence on material properties. Material properties are clearly going to depend on how the atoms are arranged. Um, they're going to affect things like band structure. They're going to affect um, thermal conductivity. Uh, whatever kind of material properties that you'd like to think about, structure is going to be an important consideration. And so this is really, when you start a crystallography class, this is the first thing you do. This is really the ground floor. But crystallography historically has not had a good way to talk about disorder. They've had a really great way to talk about order. And they've used, um, there are, uh, uh, they've developed formalisms in terms of lattice structures. And this has naturally led to the idea of group theory because different arrangements in space typically have different kinds of symmetries. And the symmetries are, um, turn out to be very important. And you can imagine why symmetry turns out to be important, not only for discovering order or disorder, but if there's a symmetry within the crystal, then that probably will uh, put a constraint on what the potentials look like inside the crystal for, let's say, a free electron that's, that's, that's moving around. And if there are symmetries in the potential, then there almost certainly have to be symmetries in the solutions to the wave functions. So they can, can, they can contribute you know, considerably to the function of, of, they can constrict considerably the space of solutions that you can find for, um, for the particles that are moving around. So um, what we're going to discover here, and I guess really the second, second thing that, that I want to emphasize and remind me if, if I don't get back to it in the end, is that just as traditional crystallography developed this idea of, um, of, of symmetries are important and they have planar groups and it's, it's quite detailed and quite in depth about what kinds of, 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 of symmetries that one can have and, and, and how they relate, we're going to find that thinking about crystals in a disordered sense naturally leads us to think about information processing in crystals and naturally leads us to think about how information is stored, information can be transferred, how these guys intrinsically compute. We don't impose that initially in the, in the discussion, but we find that it really comes out naturally. And I think that's a very nice parallel. When you think about strictly periodic crystals, you're thinking about symmetries. When you're thinking about disordered crystals, it drags you into thinking about computation in a natural setting. And, and that, that, that I think is really quite, quite nice. So um, just a little bit of the structure of today's lecture. I'm going to talk a little bit about phenomenology that we're going to look at. And I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the experimental details just to show you that this is this is th these experiments are very straightforward and very easy to do in principle. The actual 
actually doing the experiment may have some considerable subtleties involved, but the experiments themselves are very straightforward. I'm going to specialize to a particular kind of um, a crystal structure called closed pack structures. I'll explain what I mean by that for those of you who don't have a crystallographic background. Then I'll move on and I will uh, talk a little bit about how we adapt uh, computational mechanics and uh, epsilon machine spectral reconstruction to this particular case. And then I will bring it all together and I will talk about structure in crystals and how we can pull all these guys together. We can find it. We can um, write it down and we can calculate things from it and I will ultimately argue that the answer to the question what is the material structure or crystal structure in the very broadest sense the answer is an epsilon machine. Okay great so that's where we're heading so let's talk a little bit about the phenomenology I want to discuss. So um, Phenomenology is, goes under, under the, the, the rubric of polytypism frequently. And let me just tell you a little bit about polytypism. There are materials, and there are a lot of materials out there, such that there are, in two dimensions, there's very, not very strong, but there's stronger binding, let's say, in two dimensions, such that you create sheets. And, and micas, you can think of it. As I was a kid, I used to find these things in the mountain, and you could just leaf them apart just leave them apart into flat little, and so you do the same thing with graphene. That has been something that, that, that has been recently uh, uh, shown. Scotch tape will, will work for you, high, high tech there. So um, these guys, so they have fairly strong binding in two dimensions, but in the third dimension, the binding is much weaker. And so this allows for these layers maybe slip and slide against each other. So what we want to think about is a substance that is constructed, three-dimensional substance that we create by taking two-dimensional layers that themselves are individually crystalline in two dimensions and we build up a structure from that by stacking and when these layers stack there will be an option about how layers can stack on top of each other they don't necessarily have to stack in a periodic way the, the interaction between layers is weak enough so that nature if you will, can get confused, or there can even be some degeneracies in energy such that you can get a variety of different stackings. Um, the phenomenon that you find is that, um, that <coughs> many of these um, uh, compounds, and silicon carbide is one, and zinc sulfide, I'll talk more in detail later, is one. Um, for, for many of these substances, we find that there can be not only considerable disordered stackings, which is primarily what we're interested in because this is, this is really a place that, that, that crystallography has had a problem historically addressing, um, but there are also many long-range periodic stackings. So we see these really kind of um, funky crystals that may repeat, it may take 50 or 100 of these stacked layers in order for these guys to repeat over and over again. That phenomena is probably described by, not by the um, interaction between adjacent or, or even far modular layers, but probably by another type of, of, of structure called a giant screw dislocation. But we want to assume that each layer is actually completely identical and there aren't any types of um, uh, uh, defects that, 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 that would give range to um, large scale periodic structure. And we want to, um, we want to discuss, you know, how do different well-known crystal structures fit into uh, how, how we can think about these guys, how we can think about transitions between them. Um, polytypes are ubiquitous. There are a lot of them. I list some of them here. Um, these structures are thought sometimes to, to possess long-range order because of some of the, um, the stacking that is seen. We can argue that at least some of this long-range order can be produced by short-range interactions. And I won't really go into too much detail here about that, but in the end, I'll be able to show you how we how we found that. Um, and many of these guys have considerable planar disorder. So many of these guys are really rather disordered, which is uh, something that we're very interested in. So let me show you a picture of one of these guys that we're thinking about, we're going we're to look at. This is a transmission electron microscopy image of silicon carbide. Silicon carbide stacks up, just how we mentioned, and um, this is a fairly small image, and what you can see here is these bands are different kinds of crystal structure. So the crystal structure here looks a little bit different because we're 
but when, 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 when the electrons come through, it sees something that's a little bit different. And you can see that there, all these striations are changes in the crystal structure. So this guy is clearly very disordered. This guy clearly has a lot of disorder in it. And we want to be able to describe this guy. We want to be able to figure out what it is and, um, and uh, uh, find a nice compact way to, to talk about it. So this is where we're heading. We're thinking about one kind of, one kind of disorder, although there are many kinds of, we're thinking about these guys where planes are not periodically stacked, but they slide against each other. And I think this gives a nice example of that. Let me talk just a little bit, and I don't want to spend much time on this, but I should mention that we're not the first people in the world to be concerned with planar disorder. This is an old field. Um, probably uh, the oldest guy, not, not, mentioned in here, not mentioned here, but Edward Teller of, um, of the bomb fame worked on this problem, and so did Landon Lischitz. They have papers published in the, 19, in the 1930s, late 1930s. The first guy to come out with, with, with a theory uh, was a guy named Heinz Jagodinsky, who is still alive, I believe. He's had a phenomenally long publishing career, much, much longer than I can ever imagine myself having. Um, and I contacted him at one time about some of the stuff, and he was a very, very gracious gentleman. And a lot of our work is somewhat similar to his uh, early, early work, but he, of course, didn't have any of the formalism or understanding of epsilon machines or even finite state autonomy or complexity or, or anything like that. But he did have some insight into thinking about how, uh, how, how probabilities uh, in terms of how, how, how planes could be stacked on each other could, be, uh, could help describe these guys. The main, the main alternative model I want to think about is called the fault model, or we, we've, we've called it the fault model. And this is sort of what the fault model says. Hmm. Most crystals, okay, so we start off with a prejudice. Everything is a crystal. And if it's not a crystal, it's because somebody made a mistake. There is an error. Nature made a mistake. Maybe somebody hit it or whatever, but there's an error. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to say, hmm, every little piece of dirt that we find, every little piece of, um, every little specimen we have has some parent crystal in it. And yet there are, in this crystal, someone has introduced some mistakes, some stacking mistakes. So let's say that these layers were stacking up like, um, let's say there were two orientations, one like this and one like this. So it goes dump, 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 dump. And then let's say that it just does two like this. They would call this little place where you had two layers and it didn't follow the normal. They would call this a fault. And then they would describe a crystal as having a certain fraction of, a, of an amount of fault in it. Now there can be many kinds of faults. So you might describe a crystal as having, um, we'll find out there's something called deformation faults and there's something called layer displacement faults. And they would describe crystals as being permeated by these different kinds of faults with different fractions. Now from what you know about computational mechanics, you should realize that's an incredibly, uh, at best is a naive description. Um, one, it doesn't allow for the possibility that there's no parent crystal or that there's even multiple parent crystals uh, that, that are, that are uh, contained in this guy or uh, more likely no parent crystal. Um, it also doesn't allow for the fact, well, what's the spacing between adjacent faults? What does that look like? I mean, you have a, you have a density, but, but if I say there's 5% of this kind and 10% of that kind, well, how are those two related? How does it get from one to the other? What is, what is the structure of all of that? It completely leaves that out, and we really want to address that. And in addition, looking at it this way, the, the, the methods that we have been used to find it, which I will not go into, but I will tell you that they rest on, they rest fundamentally on the idea that there is an underlying crystal structure that has been contaminated in some way. And they basically will use um, deviations from uh, strict crystallinity in, a, uh, in the, an experimental signal, which is, an, which is, a, diffraction, which is a diffraction pattern, to, um, to somehow figure out what these fault densities are. Lastly, I'd like to describe something that is um, more uh, has been used more recently. This has not been particularly applied to our problem, but it is something that people do a lot of. And it's called reverse Monte Carlo modeling. And basically, what you do is you build a box. So in, 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 computationally, in a, in a computer, you build a box and you toss in a bunch of stuff. And you have some type of experimental signal that um, you get from your real sample, and you want to somehow move the atoms and the things so that they're in an arrangement where you 
that, 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 that gives you the same experimental signal that you see out there in, 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 in the lab. Okay, that's a good start. That's really nice because you're not assuming any type of underlying crystal structure or anything. Problems are, it can give you unrealistic structures, things that you really can't see. But the other thing is, another thing that's really kind of troubling is that you put 5,000 atoms in a box, you rearrange them so that you find something, then your answer is these atoms in this box are in these points. Well, that's not a very satisfying answer. It's a very long answer. It's very, and you know, and to get better results, you make bigger boxes, and with bigger boxes, you get more possible arrangements. The arrangements aren't unique. You can run it again and find a different arrangement. Uh, many of them will give rise to the same signal. There's, there's, there's no compact description, and there's no real way from that description alone to just look at it and say, well, you know, kind of what's really going on? Well, how can we understand this? I mean, it's, it's certainly a description, but it's not a very satisfying description. Our, our methodology removes all of these problems. So let's talk a little bit about closed pack structures and what they look like and how uh, crystals are, 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 are built from them. For those of you who have a background in, um, in, in, in condensed matter or, or have taken a little bit of a course, then, then, then this will be a little bit of review, but um, I, I, I want to get some of the terminology down. So closed pack structures. What we want to think of is we want to think of a bunch of spheres, oranges in a crate, if you will. And we want to try to pack these oranges as tightly as possible. Well, one way to do that is to, for each orange on a flat surface, is to have it surrounded by six other oranges. And then we continue this pattern out indefinitely. And this is called a hexagonal net. It's a two-dimensional hexagonal net. And we can completely cover a plane by doing this. And, there, and you can't get any tighter packing than this. Now, we want to add another layer to build up a three-dimensional structure. So what are we going to do? We're going to put another layer of oranges, but we want, in order to get them to pack as tightly as possible, we want to put, we don't want to put oranges right on top of each other, we want to put oranges in these little holes, or these little, um, these little pockets. And if you sit and just think about this for a second, you realize there are two ways that you can do this. I can put an orange here, here, and here, and that would be another way that I could build up a plane that way. Or, alternatively, I could put an orange here, uh, here, here, and here, or I could put it here, here, and here. So if I just stack these guys up, it turns out that there are two alternative ways that I can put the next layer on top of the first layer. Um, as it turns out, and you have to go through, um, I mean, you, you really need to look at a three-dimensional model and stare at it a little while to convince you that this is true. But if you think about an atom here as being one of the oranges is to atom, and you ask yourself, what do all my nearest neighbors look like, and what do all of my next nearest neighbors look like? The answer is, is that for closed pack structures, it doesn't matter the, the stacking if I stack. Uh, no matter how I stack it, they'll still have the same arrangement uh, for an atom to say, what is what does my immediate neighborhood look like? What are my nearest neighbors, and what are my next nearest neighbors? It doesn't matter how you stack it. They still have the same, um, they still look the same to the, to the orange. So let's talk just a little bit about how we're going to do this stacking. And I want to talk about a common, I want to talk about a couple of common stacking structures that, that, that we will rely on heavily. One is called um, hexagonal close packs uh, uh, structures. And the hexagonal comes from the fact that when we do the stacking in this fashion, we'll end up with a crystal that will have an overall hexagonal symmetry. Um, but let's not get hung up on that. Let's just see how we build one. Um, again, here are our oranges. And just to help visualize the planes a little bit, we've drawn these, are, these uh, red and these blue lines connecting. You're to imagine that this is just to help you realize and connect the uh, surface of atoms that are in one plane as opposed to the other. And you'll see this is how it gets stacked up. This is one way to stack it up. And if I look in this side, I can see it from the side. I can see that if I go here, here, and then if I make layers that are separated by a distance of two, if I make those identical, and I just continue building this up, I get the hexagonal closed pack structure. OK. Alternatively, I could create something called a cubic closed pack structure. And this is also called a face-centered cubic because if you twist it and turn it in a certain way, it has the symmetry of, uh, it has a symmetry that has um, been described by, uh, you can describe by a square unit cell with atoms at each corner, and additionally, atoms placed on each face. So it's also called face-centered cubic. But we don't need to get hung up on the, 
on, on the terminology. For our purposes, what we need to know is that this guy is going to utilize all three possible positions that we can um, place adjacent layers. So it turns out to be three, and you can see that at the very bottom we have the, um, we have the red, and then we put the uh, green in a place that was in, 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 some, in some of those holes so that it was different from the red. And then finally, we put this blue layer so that it's different from the previous two. So when we stack this guy up, the rule that we're going to have is we start off with a layer. Let's say we start off with these three layers in this configuration. And when we put the next layer up, we always make sure that it is different from the previous two. So it, we want to think this guy somehow knows that it has to be different from the previous two layers that it saw. And we always know that those two layers under it, since they are adjacent layers, they don't have the same stacking orientation. They'll have two different stacking orientations. And so there will be a third one that will be uniquely different from the previous two. If we stack this up, we end up with something called a cubic closed path structure. Fairly straightforward? Cool, cool. Simple stuff, simple stuff, but, but you know, it's important we get this grounding here. Um, it turns out that this picture of just simply single atoms sitting there and, uh, and, and, and stacking, that, that, that not a lot of interesting materials, or some of the materials that we want to think about aren't quite that simple, but instead of having a single atom here, there's going to be some structure to these little units. And so we want to consider a very simple kind of structure that turns out to be rather common and, and, and appears. And I'll and show you what that is. And I want to show you an alternative way of describing the stacking structure. Um, well, let me yeah, I'll show you an alternative way to describe. To uh, describe. Uh, Nikki, did you have a question? OK. <laughs> you, you look like you might. So um, we're going to talk more in depth about the structure of zinc sulfide. Uh, but this. This title really, uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be zinc sulfide. There are a number of materials that stack this way, and uh, silicon carbide is certainly one. So our basic unit layer now, the orange that we looked at, when we look down on it, we're going to have to think that it's really two atoms. And in this case, it is a zinc and a, um, a sulfur atom. And they're separated, by, they're separated by a distance. They come up each. Each atom of each kind is tetrahedrally bonded to four atoms of the opposite kind. And it stacks up to make a lattice this way. And if you go, it, it, it's not completely obvious when you look at it. You have to think about it. At least I do. My, it, 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 yeah, you know, these three-dimensional things are a little bit, got to think a little bit. But um, these stack exactly according to the same rules that I described earlier with just the oranges. No different, except that instead of having a single atom, I now just have two stacked on each other. Now, we can label each of the layers as being either an A layer, a B layer, or a C layer. And whichever, however we choose to label, it's completely arbitrary. There are three orientations, and traditionally they've been called A, B, and C. But we can do something that's nice. We can take advantage of the fact that no two adjacent layers are allowed to have the same orientation. So when we stack one layer on top of the next one, we can think that the layer has been uh, either rotated or slid in one direction or another relative to the layer below it. And we can call all rotations that go, or all, we can call all sequence that go A to B, B to C, C to A. We can now label that by a one. And we can now label the A to C to B to A by zero. So we have two alphabets running around. They're alternative descriptions. This is actually going to turn out to be helpful. You might think that, well, this is getting very unpleasant. But it's actually going to be very nice for us uh, a little bit later on. Not very nice, but it's actually going to be a little bit helpful. But I can alternatively describe the stacking of, a, um, of, of, of an entire macro crystal, you know, a million layers. I can give you either the ABC sequence. Or I can give you the 0, 1 sequence. They are identical up to an overall rotation of the crystal. So um, you lose essentially one or so bit of information when you go from the ABC to the 0, 1. But, they are but other than that overall rotation where you lose that bit, they are essentially um, invertible. It's a little more than a bit. But we can think of these guys then in terms of zeros and ones. And that turns out to be an alternative that alternative way to think about it that is, that is very nice. So, I told you about two crystal structures, hexagonal closed pack, and what I call 3C cubic, uh, cubic closed pack. Uh, 
I want to show you some other possible stacking sequences that are seen in nature. Uh, yes, Nikki. No. Okay, so if you had a larger language, it would still be the same thing? Um, well, this, if, if you had a, a, a um, you would have to come up with a particular scheme. If you wanted to have this kind of mapping between one alphabet and another, you'd really need to know, I really want to look at the specifics of that alphabet. But what I mean by that is that for, just sort of specifically what I mean in this case, is that for every uh, zero one sequence I give you, I give you a million zero one sequences, then there are really, I'm really representing, this is really representing three physical stackings. It's representing a stacking that I start with an A and build it up according to the zero ones, or a B, or a C. And so the amount of information I need to specify that, you can think of as the amount of information that's lost. So it would be, you know, uh, log base two of three, I guess. Okay. Something like that, roughly. Don't quote me. <laughs> yes? I'm not entirely seeing your mapping. Go yes. Okay. Well, um, let me let me just write it out on the board. So the example I have is A, B, A, B, C, A. So going from an A to a B, I write that as a one. Going from a B to an A, I write that as a zero. A to B is a one. B to C is a one and C to A is a 1. Yeah. And if I tell you that I start with an A layer, and then I give you this sequence, you can rebuild that. Right. Precisely. So we started out with the case of just assuming, well, we have sequences, and we're just going to da 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 But when we start looking at nature, nature throws curveballs, little things that you wouldn't think. You wouldn't normally think about trying to do something like this. So. Uh, Nature has a way of, 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 of changing things on you. So here's some common stacking structures. I've told you about two. One is the hexagonal closed pact, and one is the, uh, what, what we call the 3C. And let me show you a couple more. And I, I, I hope you can see this. So here, the 3C is the same as the FCC. And you can see that I have just the stacking ABC, 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 ABC. Or in terms of the other notation, the 0-1 notation, which is commonly referred to as the Hag notation. Um, typically, the Hag notation, they call it plus and minus, but we always just use one and zero because it's much easier to write. So this particular sequence would just be described as a series of ones, or I can write this one, and the little asterisk on top means repeat whatever is in the parentheses as many times as you want. The 2H, you can see that this guy is just going to be, ah, so the 3C, so there are two 3C possible structures. One is ABC, ABC. The other is um, ACB, ACB, and you can see that that would be just a series of zeros. The 2H structure, um, one way to look at it is AB, 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 which would be just repeating 10, 10, 10. Um, just in terms of the nomenclature that we used before, we referred to this as the period one, because it has period one in and it repeats itself. And we referred to this last time as the period two. So these are actually familiar things that you've seen before. These are, these are, these are things that you, you should be able to recognize. Now we also have alternative stackings. One is called the 4H, and typically the number in front tells you the repeat distance in the physical number of layers. So this should have a repeat period of four. And if we just write out a sample sequence, this, is, this corresponds to a 1100. Zero, zero. So 1100, zero, zero, 1100, zero, zero. nice and periodic. Um, it turns out that a very important stacking sequence for a lot of the materials that, that, that are technologically interesting is called the 6H. And this is just simply 1110011100. It turns out that um, for silicon carbide especially, um, the 3C, the 2H, and the 6H are, are important. Just to give you a few more, you can look at these guys. And uh, this one's 110010, 110010. And something that we call the 9R, even though in this notation, the, the Hague notation, it just goes 011011, you'll notice that if I go 0, then 1, 1, when I stack the next layer, I've sort of had a rotation from the bottom layer to where I start the next one. So I have to go through three cycles of this to get back to the original 
layer, to get back to the original orientation, the absolute orientation of the bottom layer, and so that's nine layers I have to go through, and that's why we get the nine. So this notation actually turns out to be much more compact and, I would argue, more useful. Let's look at some of this actually in crystals. Um, and, and, you know, you might think this is awfully fantastic. You say, this just can't possibly happen. How can little crystals do this? This is just right. Let's look at some um, actual pictures of these guys. So um, this I, I got from a, a, a 2011 um, paper. Um, I'm sorry, not a paper. It's actually a book that is open access online. And you, here's the doughy so you can see it. Uh, Let's look at what this guy is. I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see. This is um, high resolution transmission electron microscopy. And what we're actually looking at is we're looking at the side along the layers that are stacking up. Here, we see that this region, and it's maybe easiest to see here, we have, we have um, uh, basically two kinds of layers, the bright and then the, the, the dark that's hard to see. This is period two. This is 2H structure. This is a 2H crystal. This is a little piece of 2H. Underneath it, it's hard to see here, but underneath it, it also looks to be the same. So we have a little piece of crystal here that's 2H. But separating this guy, all of a sudden, it looks like, it's hard to tell exactly what this is, but it, it looks like that instead of um, um, doing the alternating layers, when it gets to here, it, uh, it breaks that pattern, and it does something here. But what's interesting to look at is if we go to this little piece right here, and we see that all of a sudden that the layers are no longer alternating back and forth, but it looks like they're just going over to the side. This little piece of uh, crystal looks like it is stacked in what we would think of as 3C, going ABC, 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 or 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So this shows a crystal that has 2H, 2H, interspersed with something that looks like 3C, and something that looks like a vault. We want to be able to describe this. We want to be able to look not at just a little piece of crystal, but at something that's millions of layers long and be able to describe what this looks like in a statistical sense. Um, here you see sort of the same thing. Again, 2H and then 3C. Uh, to show you something that's even more uh, exotic looking, I apologize, uh, this is not as good of a picture. This is also high resolution transmission electron microscopy. Um, from the Journal of Alloys and Compounds, but this is 1999, so it's a little old, and so the picture's not quite as good. But they've given us this nice stuff on the side so that we can see kind of what's going on. Um, this guy right here, and let's not worry about exactly what the ABCs are, but you can sit and, and work that out in 0-1 notation. But the idea here is that it goes through something that's 2H, uh, it looks like 2H crystal. And again, there's this little region in here where somehow that regular stacking gets broken. And then if we go up here, it continues 2H. So this would maybe be a region that you might want to call vaulting. I would think of it as vaulting. It's something that, that w w where it, it's no longer, I mean, it's no longer it looks like there's, there is a regular stacking pattern for this little guy here. Um, you can see even longer period polytypes change. And in this one, we have just a direct change from the 8H, and the 8 means that this guy has um, a symmetry, uh, a repeat distance of H, of 8. And let me just tell you what the 8H is. It wasn't on the previous side. 8H is 1, 1, 1, 1, four ones, then 0, 0, 0, 0, four zeros. And then you can see that here. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 ones. Well, it breaks right there. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4 ones, then 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros, and it goes back and forth. It has a little break here and does some funny stuff, and then it starts stacking here in the 4H. This is all one crystal, people. This is all one crystal. Over here, we have something that looks like 4H, where that was the 1, 1, 0, 0 that's stacking up. Then it changes to what we might think of, this apparently is about 17 layers, so is that long enough to be considered a periodic stacking structure? I don't know, you know, you, you decide. But so this is, this looks like 3C, and then it goes to 8H. So these guys, they're really out there, and they can have pretty exotic stacking structures, things that aren't that easily described. And the same little crystal can have different stacking structures in it. Um, I should note that this is, this is actually, this crystal is, is zinc selenide that has been doped with uh, magnesium, and the doping, the X here, is about 
um, somewhere between 0.17 and 0.21. So it's got just a little bit of extra magnesium in it. And when you do that, it, 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 it tends to induce this behavior. You, you get this guy that turns out to be poly, polytypic. And that's another way that you find polytypes is by doping. Because that can change the interlayer, the energy between um, these layers, and it can cause layers to become nearly degenerate. And in stacking arrangements to become nearly degenerate, as they're ordered. Questions? Well, let me, I, I, I want to talk, okay, great. So we know about structure, close packed. We, we know how that stacks up. We're all good with that. I'd like to talk now just a little bit about how we actually do these experiments. And the idea that I want to get across here is these are tabletop experiments. This is, um, uh, we're basically using very standard diffraction experiments that were developed 100 years ago. The basic technique was developed 100 years ago for looking at these guys. Um, they're relatively inexpensive experiments to do. They are non-destructive. When, uh, uh, when you have a crystal and you, and you do a diffraction experiment that you end up not destroying the crystal. Um, and they can be done, I mean, we, we could easily do it in this room. We could do it on one of these tabletops. In principle, these kinds of experiments that we're going to use to, to, to find structure are going to look like this. Um, if you remember your um, introductory physics class, we just have, imagine we have an incident, um, an incident wave, and these will be x-rays. They come in and then they bounce off. They don't really bounce off. This is a bad picture in one sense because it sort of makes it look like they bounce off the atoms. They're really bouncing off the electrons. But what's important is the periodic nature of the electrons as you go from one to the other. So they hit one layer and they reflect, and then another layer they reflect. And um, it turns out that these guys can interfere with each other. And this is just very standard wave interference, which you can see everywhere. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is, in principle, this is very straightforward to do. You usually measure experimentally the angle theta, or more commonly, they list it as two theta. Um, the one, one way to do this kind of experiment is using something called a, a four-circle diffractometer. And here's just a little schematic. I have a little GIF on the next page for you to look at. And, uh, but the idea is, is that you put a crystal in here, and then you shine an X-ray beam, and that you just look at this reflected intensity, and you measure the intensity of the reflected radiation. So let's see if this next one will work. This just uh, this is just a cute little GIF I just found, and I thought we would give it a go. And this just sort of shows you um, schematically of what this guy might look like. Uh, so here, this is going to be your X-ray beam. Here's your crystal, and these are going to be the angles that you can control. And it just shows you what those guys look like. So you can turn the crystal around. That's one of those angles. Then you can turn this arm and orient the crystal. Then you can do the omega, I believe, is next. And then finally, so you can turn it again. We've already seen that rotation. Um, uh, but we're going to have to look at it. So it's going back to the original. And then we can turn this angle to theta. And this is, in principle, the angle that you turn in the experiment. And then this guy is your detector, so that this actually measures the diffractive intensity. In principle, very simple experiment. There can be complications, of course. We may want to do this in vacuum. So you've got this guy may need to be um, isolated somehow in a, in a vacuum. You may uh, want to temperature control it. There could be a number. You may have a reactive substance that can't be exposed to air. Uh, there are any number of things that can cause uh, uh, this to be complicated. And uh, in addition, orienting these crystals can be a bit of a challenge. So, so I mean, it's not, I don't want to give the impression this is a trivial experiment that, 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 that anyone can do. But the basic ideas are very straightforward and it's pretty well understood how to, how to solve most of these problems. Um, to get a good diffraction spectrum, I think typically you need about 12 hours or so. Maybe it's a little less. I, I'm not sure exactly, but it's something, it doesn't take, you know, that long of a time. And, you know, you have a computer program that can just run this thing. Once you get it set up, you can leave the room and it, and it will run and it will take the data for you. So, so this is actually, so these are the experiments that we want to look at are going to be diffraction experiments. And these are, in principle, they're very simple to do and they're fairly readily accessible. I'm not suggesting this is the only way that one can try to find crystal structure, but this is a very common way. So now, we're going to look at diffraction experiments, and it turns out that diffraction, because it's adding up wave magnitudes, it turns out that diffraction is a power spectrum. Um, 
I, I don't want to prove that to you. I hope you'll just believe it to me. But it's exactly the same kind of power spectrum that we talked about last time. It is mathematically no different. Except now, there are going to be some subtleties. Remember that translating the language going from 0, 1 to 0, 1? Well, what that means is that instead of having an alphabet, and we're going to want to think of each layer in the crystal being either A, B, or C as coming from an alphabet and thinking of those as a symbol sequence in space. Um, last time we sort of thought about time, looking at something coming in, in time, although we didn't really specify that, but when I said frequency, it made it sound like time. Here we really are looking in terms of space, but it's the same thing. There's no mathematical difference. So we're going to have these stacking of layers as they go up, and they can either be A, B, or C. And so our correlation functions are going to look a little bit different. We're going to have correlations between um, layers. Uh, we, we won't just have um, either like or different. We'll have to say, well, this layer is it, does it go from an A to a B, and we'll call that a cyclic rotation, but it may be separated by some distance. Or does it do the opposite, or are two layers separated at some distance in the same? When we do that, the expression for the diffraction spectra is a little bit more complicated, but I want to tell you this, the principle is precisely the same. And uh, I don't want to focus on this too much, but here we have the same sum over all of these layers. And here we have the n minus n term that we saw before. But now we have two correlation functions that turn out to be independent. So we have both of these guys in the expression for the diffracted intensity. Um, this just gives rise to a little delta function whenever L is equal to an integer. So, um, looking at this guy, we have these two correlation functions. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, this prefactor term, there are lots of things that can affect the measured intensity, and experimentalists are fairly well understood, um, but one does have to take them into account, and we can, we can do that here. Um, I've told you what the, the Q's are, and let me just show you in exactly the same spirit that we did last time. Um, we can expand these terms, uh, these, cos these two cosine terms, and get sines and cosines, and we can Fourier analyze it, Fourier analyze it exactly like we did last time, and we'll find that we get two integrals that are, 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 um, are independent, and I've drawn this little circle, meaning that now I'm not going to specify the integral of the interval of integration, but I'm just going to say it's over a unit interval. I get to choose the unit. I have, hopefully, a nice broad unit, and I can choose whatever unit I want. Um, in terms of the correlation functions, we have um, the correlation functions for two layers at a distance n being cyclically related. And by cyclic, I mean I have an A layer here, and some distance n away, I have a layer that's cyclically related, so it would be B. Um, is given by this expression. And then we have the same thing for Q sub A. The A stands for anticyclic. So an A would go to, let's say, a C. And we can get all this from Fourier analysis. Um, it turns out that due to this, due to this constraint, that two layers can't be the same, cannot be uh, identical when we stack one on top of the other, that we end up with some constraints that the diffraction spectrum must obey. It doesn't matter how it's stacked, however it was stacked, these things have to be true. We call these figures of merit. We didn't have this last time, but it's because of this funny mapping between these two alphabets, and particularly the constraint that no two layers can be the same, that we get these guys, we call them gamma and beta, and these have to be true. Um, gamma always has to be equal to minus one half, and beta always has to be equal to one. And so we can calculate these guys over different candidate intervals for this spectrum, where the interval is, is measured in terms of L. And um, we can then use these guys to look for intervals where we know that this has to be true. We know that diffraction spectra can be sometimes hard to, to, to fully correct for everything. We know that sometimes there can be error. So we can look for intervals or regions of the diffraction spectrum that are relatively error-free, or that we think are probably relatively error-free, that at least meet these basic conditions. So that allows us kind of, that gives us some guidance in choosing how we want to um, define our correlation functions. Okay, so now we're going to start pulling correlation functions, and uh, now we're going to start pulling um, the idea behind diffraction spectra and structure uh, together and start looking at what do some of these common stacking structures that I've talked about, what do their diffraction patterns look like? In the same way we did on Tuesday, we want to develop an intuition.
So when we do that, let me just show you some common ones. And since these are periodic structures, then it means that all of the stacking, well, uh, stacking is periodic, so it has no entropy. It turns out that all of the diffracted intensity is pure point, and in a diffraction setting, we call these Bragg reflections, or Bragg peaks. And you can see that the 3C is um, the period of this guy in physical space is 3. In, uh, in head notation, it's just a bunch of 1s um, going back and forth. And I use the plus to, say, to uh, say that this is different from a minus, which would be a bunch of zeros. Uh, if it has a 3 here, you expect the periodicity to be uh, in real space to be every three layers. So in terms of L, the periodicity, the um, in, 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 in terms of the inverse variable L that we measure, it, L just indexes the angle of uh, the diffracted radiation. We get something that's at one third, and we get a very sharp spike at one third. In order to, um, I calculated all of these guys numerically, and I used 10,000 layers just like I did last time to calculate them. 2H, so this is our hexagonal close pack, the one that, one of the ones that we discussed earlier, it has a zero one, repeated over and over again, so you would expect that since this is period two, and it's period two in real space, that we should see a lot of action at L equal a half and L equal one, and we do. 4H, you would expect then that in reciprocal space, we call this L space reciprocal space, here that uh, you would see things at, uh, at one quarter, one half, and three quarters, just integer, integer amounts of one over four. So we get something that looks like this. And then 6H, which turns out to be fairly important, turns out looking like this. Uh, for 6H, interestingly enough, there is no diffracted intensity at L equal 1 or L equals 0. Uh, it turns out that that Bragg reflection gets canceled out when you, when, you, um, when, when you go through the math. So you actually don't see that, but you get these five spikes instead. And again, 6 is the physical repeat distance, so um, integer values... Um, 1 over 6 times the integer values where you expect to see the diffracted intensity. So this is what crystallographers use to find crystal structure. They look for these guys right here, and then they know what kind of crystals correspond to these kinds of, of peaks, and then they can then pick out the kind of crystal that you have. Now, in real experiments that people look at, frequently they're looking at things that are much more complicated than this. Um, but, but in principle, it's exactly the same. Um, let's start. Um, let's start talking about emissary and what emissary is going to look like. Um, we talked about how to get the correlation functions from diffraction spectra, and just as we did on Tuesday, we're going to have to solve a set of equations to find sequence probabilities. And so, what we want to do now is we want to look for now that we have the correlation functions. These correlation functions are between the absolute layers and the ABC sequence. We want to actually use the head notation and think of the sequences. Um, and find probabilities of sequences that are in terms of, of the Hegg notation, so that we have zeros and ones as describing little bits of, 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 of crystal, as, as I showed you, you argued that we could do. But the physical stacking is still A, B, and C. And when we write, so that's going to make our uh, spectral equations a little different. And in fact, this is what they look like. You don't need to sit and stare at the whole thing and try to understand it. It's just the same thing, but, but just, just to show you, it's just the same thing. These are R equal 3, and we find that we really need R equal 3 to, at least R equal 3, to discuss and understand some of the experimental diffraction spectra that I'll show you. Um, these are just conservation of probability. Uh, this is normalization of probability, and these are the constraints on the probability that are given by the correlation functions. In this particular slide, I, down and bad, um, the R here should be an A, this is an earlier notation, but it meant reverse, but this should be C for cyclic and A for anticyclic. So just replace all those R's by A's. It's the same thing that we saw earlier. That's not bad. Um, just to remind you of what the emissary algorithm looks like now, We take an experimental diffraction pattern uh, that someone gives us, and we extract experimental correlation functions guided by use of the figures of merit to pick a good interval of integration to 
to try to reconstruct from. We solve the spectral equations for a given R. We reconstruct the epsilon machine. We calculate the uh, correlation functions and diffraction spectra. Then we compare with theory and experiment. And if we get bad agreement, and however you wish to define bad agreement, but you think that it, it is unsatisfactory by some objective standard, hopefully, that, that you come up with, then you just increment R and do the whole thing again. And when you finally get agreement that is within, let's say, the um, the experimental error that, of, of, of the apparatus that you use, then you would quit, and that epsilon machine would be what you would call, I mean, that, that's your answer. And that is the description of the stacking structure of the crystal. So this is an R equals 3 epsilon machine. Let's just look briefly at what the causal state structure of an R equals 3 epsilon machine looks like. And everything we do will really be based on this. The R equal 3, it has a total of, of eight causal states, 16 transitions between these causal states. Each causal state is labeled by the last three symbols seen. And we've written this in um, base 10 notation for, let's say, probability to be in causal state S6, uh, where the 6, you should translate that to binary and get 110. So 110 would be the last three um, symbol seen. Um, and we, uh, this is the most general kind of structure at R equal 3 that we can find. So we want to recreate this creature using correlation functions that we got from diffraction spectrum. Let's now start to bring, so we have stacking structure over here that we know about and we can find. We know what it looks like in terms of diffraction spectra. Now let's start pulling that together and asking ourselves, what does the epsilon machine look like for known diffraction patterns, for things that, that, that we have seen? But before we do that, the first thing that we need to do is we need to think about um, how these guys are, are, are going to look on an epsilon machine. And we want to think a little bit differently than, 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 than you traditionally think. Usually you think about what causal state am I in, you know, and that will tell me my future. Here we want to think of crystal structure in the, in the very strict periodic sense. The crystal structure is just a repetition of some series of zeros and ones. And that repetition means it's going to be some kind of cycle. So we want to define something that we call a causal state cycle. And by a causal state cycle, and I'll show you examples of these on the, on the next slide, uh, they're non-self-intersecting closed, symbol-specific paths on an epsilon machine. Mouthful. What it means is that I start from one causal state, and I always just I keep going around. I keep going around a little family of causal states, to just back and just just keep going around and around, and that will create my crystal structure. Let's look at what the three C structure looks like on an R equals three epsilon machine. So here it is. Let me remind you. This is what the diffraction spectrum looks like. This is what the, the crystal structure is in terms of the Hague notation, and this is what it looks like on an R equals 3 epsilon machine. The first thing you can notice is we don't really need R equals 3 to describe it, but it turns out useful because we're going to consider disordered cases where we, where we really will need these other causal states. So this is a causal state stifle that just uh, is period 1, and it just goes around and around and around, and if P7 here is 1, then this, causal, then this causal state cycle, this epsilon machine is just going to spend all its time doing this. Um, if I wanted to get zeros, I would do the same over here, except that this piece of zero would be zero, so that I get the probability of returning the state to be one. And that would be an example of two causal state cycles on an epsilon machine. And it corresponds exactly to crystal structures that we know and are happy and familiar with. This thing gives me the picture of the next slide, and it freaks me out sometimes. So sorry, I'll look back and I look at it. So um, let's look at hexagonal close time. Again, here's the diffraction spectrum. So we know what that looks like. Um, uh, hexagonal close path is just the period 2, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 in the Hague notation. On an epsilon machine, it lives here. It lives between S2 and S5. It just goes back and forth. So this is period 2. And so when I see things on an epsilon machine that oscillate between two causal states that are emitting a zero and then a one alternatively, and it's the only place it happens on this epsilon machine is here, then this is what we would traditionally think of as 2H structure. So there's this nice idea we can think of um, 
we can think of diffraction patterns. Uh, we know what they look like, and then we know what they look like on an Epsilon machine. So now what we want to think about, instead of the, the stacking that I, I showed you earlier, we want to start thinking about crystal structures as these cycles on an Epsilon machine. That is the crystal structure in the very strict sense. If, if these guys, for instance, if P2 were 1 and P5 were 0, such that it was restricted to go between these two. Let's look at a couple more, and then I'll show you what happens if you have no stacking, if you have um, no crystal structure at all, such that you have a complete random stacking. Here is 4H, and again, this is the only place that 4H lives on this guy, this Epsilon machine. And in order to get 4H, you then have to follow this cyan path. And if you do that repeatedly, you will generate the 4-H structure. It looks like this when you do the experiment. And in notation, it's just 1, 1, 0, it's just 0, 0, 1, 1. So we can just go through and catalog all the possibilities. I will not go through them all for you. I realize that would be a little long. But uh, one more, because it's important, and that is the 6-H. This is where 6-H lives on an articles 3 epsilon machine. And again, we just go through and, and, and do the same thing that we did before. It's the only way you're going to get 6H structure is if you can repeat this cycle you know, a number of times long enough to keep making um, uh, 1, 1, 1, I'm sorry, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So we start looking at these, so instead of thinking as much in terms of causal states, but more in terms of the cycles that they make when we, when we start stringing them together, this is crystal structure. Um, what if we had absolutely no, to help build intuition, I just want to look, what if we had absolutely no pattern there at all, that we had just a completely random stacking of crystals, of, um, of, of, of these layers? Well, if we did that, we called that just the random process on Tuesday, and when we saw on Tuesday, we got just a completely flat, do you recall, just a completely flat spectrum, it was just, had no structure at all? Due to stacking constraints, it turns out that for completely random stacking of layers, we get something that looks like this. This spectrum is entirely diffuse. So this is the first diffuse spectrum I've shown you today. So it is completely diffuse. It has no Bragg peak anywhere, has not, not at the inner, just nowhere. Uh, and it looks like this. So this is good to keep sort of in the back of our mind. That if we see something that's starting to look a lot like this, and we're seeing something that is probably pretty disordered, because this is as, this is as disordered as you can get. Um, on an Epsilon machine, the Epsilon machine for this, we can't really show you, I can't really write out this on an Epsilon machine as a series of causal state cycles because it's not a crystal structure. And the causal state structure for the random process, of course, is just a single state with probability of one half to admit a one and probability of one half to admit a zero. And so it doesn't really live on any place in particular on the Epsilon machine. But if I did have this guy and did find the correlation functions, I would find that I would get this big Epsilon machine, or, or if I went to R equals 3 and tried to write down the probabilities, I would find that the entire Epsilon machine would collapse down into a single state. I just want to show you what all the, um, what these uh, guys that we've looked at so far, uh, how they look, just, just to remind you once again, and this is the same graph that you've seen. I'll tell you that there are 19 possible causal state cycles on an R equals 3 epsilon machine that we can write down. If we go to R equals 4, this goes up to 179 possible causal state cycles. That means there are 179 possible crystal structures that we can model with this guy. Now, this is, even, sorry, this is even a little bit out of the spirit of what we talked about before, but let's try to make a connection with what people know before. And so people know that in some of these crystals there are certain kinds of faults that they think are common and, and, and they think exist. Let's try to make a connection on our Epsilon machine with what those kinds of crystal defects would look like. But I want to emphasize, we're doing this to make contact with previous work. The Epsilon machine doesn't need to do this. The Epsilon machine is itself a complete description. Whatever we find for the Epsilon machine, it is a complete description of what the stacking structure looks like. Um, if we do that, let's just look at faulting structures for 3C. We're, we're going to get to, an, a, a very, very shortly, just after we finish this guy, we'll start looking at actual diffraction spectra. But let me just tell you what some of these guys are. And these are known, known crystallographers know about these for a long time. So if we have a 3C structure, remember 3C lives over here or over here. And a growth fault just means that I have a bunch of zeros that are going up. And we remember that for the 3C structure, we said that the rule was that the next layer was different from the previous two. Well, we break that rule and we introduce uh, a, a, a case where it's not. 
uh, as the same as the second preceding one. And what that will do is it will induce a change in going from, let's say, 000 to 111. And on an R equals 3 epsilon machine, it looks like this. But this fault is simple enough, or this, this guy is simple enough that we can actually express this on R equals 1. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're really expanding it out to look at it this way, uh, but it's actually fairly, fairly simple. Um, a deformation fault is in blue. What this guy does is it just inserts a single zero into the stacking structure. And we could also express this guy as an R equals, I'm sorry, for the, for the growth fault, we can, no, 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 we, we do need R equals one here too. We can also express this as R equals one, but if we look at it on R equals three, we end up with this um, causal state cycle. And then for the, uh, for the other three C, we have this guy. And then there's finally something called a layer displacement fault. And without just going through all, all the details of what these guys look like, I'm just telling you what they are, how they're expressed in terms of the Hague notation. Um, if you have a series of ones, it turns out that we flip three spins in a row. That's not, it's difficult to do, but it's not quite as ugly as you might think, because what it corresponds to is A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and then going, instead of going A, B, C, instead of going A, B, C, A, it goes A, C, B, A, and then it goes back to the regular stacking. So it only, it takes two layers and just shifts them relative to each other. So it's not quite as ugly as it looks. But this is what the structure would look like. And since we go back to, we start off at, let's say, 3C plus, and we end up at 3C plus, this guy just makes a circuit all the way around. And in fact, this can also be expressed on a much smaller epsilon machine than this. So we're, this is really expanded out, and we don't need to expand it this much typically. But when we see multiple fault structures, it turns out that we really do need the full architecture at R equals 3. Um, 2H have exactly the same kind of series of faults. A growth fault is just an insertion of a single spin, let's say a zero, and it, this is where the 2H structure lives. And if we insert a single zero, uh, that would be inserting a one. If we insert a single zero, so going back and forth, it gets to two, we, can insert, we see a zero and then a one, and then a zero, and then it goes back to the same stacking structure that we had before. So, when we see structures like this, then we need to start thinking the possibility that these guys are growth faults. Deformation faulting looks like this. I, you can work it out for yourselves. I, I, I won't go through the, through the details, but this is what these guys look like. And then finally, layer displacement fault on a, um, on a 2H crystal. Now, I've only drawn one possible way it could fall. It, I've shown it so that it, it breaks the crystal structure, the, the 2H is here, it breaks it here and goes up and follows around. But I could just as well have shown that it breaks here and goes around and does, uh, I'm sorry, it breaks here and goes around and does this. So there are really two of them and I've only shown you one. Um, but there's, there's, this guy has a, has a pair. We're only doing this so that we can make contact with what people already know. The Epsilon machine is a perfectly fine description, and um, we could end up with Epsilon machines that we can't really dissolve or resolve into these particular kinds of, of little cycles. The Epsilon machine will still be a fine description, but the fault model will break down, and trying to describe things in terms of fault will be, faults will be uh, a nonsensical exercise if you have sufficiently uh, disordered crystal. And so this scheme that I've shown you will break down, but it's not because of the epsilon machine. It's not because of our description. It's because of the way that it's been looked at previously. Let's do an example. Let's think about zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide um, people have known about for a while. It was discovered in uh, 1948. There are, um, there are lots of different observed crystalline um, structures for this guy, um, and they can exist under virtually identical thermodynamic conditions, which is really kind of interesting. Um, the longest period observed is claimed to be 114 modular layers, where modular layer is just that layer I was talking about earlier. It's really the double layer, but just, just think of it as one layer. Uh, so 114, so it means, it means I start with a layer, I go through a sequence of 114 before I start over again, and I continue doing that. This is probably due to, to something called a giant screw location, which I can show you a little bit later if you want to look at, and it's not really something that we're interested in too much. But it does, it, it does, it does emphasize the fact these guys don't have very complicated structures, um, stacking structures. Um, 
We see these in both mineral and synthetic zinc sulfide. They're only thought to be two stable structures for zinc sulfide. One is the hexagonal closed pack, and the other is the face-centered cubic. And finally, uh, the stable structure depends upon what the, temp the, the, the what we think is a stable structure tend, uh, depends on what temperature it's at. And this temperature is believed to be around 1,000 degrees centigrade, uh, such that above this temperature that you have the FCC as the stable structure, and below, I'm sorry, that above this temperature, no, that's right, above this temperature you have the um, hexagonal uh, closed pack as the um, stable structure, and below it you have the, uh, the 3C or the FCC as the stable structure. So what one can do is the following, and I'll show you an example where it happens. One can take one of these crystals and you can grow it in the lab or something, and you can grow it at a temperature that is above 1,000 degrees centigrade. Or you can just find any crystal that you want. Now, the, now, now, these are layers. These layers are hard to move around. I mean, because even though they have to generate energies, and, and there's these, these guys, they can slide over each other relatively easy. You're still moving an entire layer in a crystal, so it doesn't happen just nilly-willy. Um, but if you heat them up enough such that what their structure is is no longer the stable structure, and there's another structure that would be lower in the free energy that would be lower, then these guys will try to slide to transform to that. So what we'll end up seeing is that we'll have structures where there will be parts of the original structure maybe here, there will be parts that are disordered connecting it to things that look like a structure is trying to transform into. And the whole thing can end up being fairly, um, uh, it sounds very disordered, but the disorder has a great deal of structure in it. It's not just something that is, um, that, that that happens without any kind of causal site architecture. We find that the causal site architecture is quite, um, is more complicated than you might imagine. Let's look at it. Let's look at an experimental diffraction spectra. What I'm going to show you comes from um, a book written by Sebastian and Krishna, and it's on page 134 for those of you who want to look it up. And I'm going to show you the experimental um, diffraction spectra. And this guy has been corrected for all the experimental. Um, effects. So what you can see here is that when you look at this raw spectrum is it, hmm, something ain't right because just because the diffraction spectra it has to be periodic in L. I didn't really emphasize that when I showed you the, the diffraction spectrum spectra earlier this lecture, but when I did on Monday, when I did on Tuesday, we argued that it had to be periodic with period one. So this peak should look the same as this peak. And they don't. Clearly, there's some error. So what we can do is we can use the figures of merit to somehow try to find an interval here. We need a unit interval in L that will give us a relatively error-free integration interval. And we do that. And so we look at this guy. We find that it turns out that, so here's our diffraction spectrum again, it's just the same on the previous slide. It turns out that if we do this over initial starting values of L, which I call L naught, that the best place for this guy where it seems to be closest to being error free is right about here, starting at L naught equals zero, which means that it turns out that this interval seems to us to be roughly error free. Roughly, roughly is the best candidate that we have for something that's error free. It doesn't mean it is error free, but at least it's obeying things closer to what we know have to be true than other uh, intervals are. So this is nice. We can, we can tell if, 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 if we have significantly corrupted diffraction spectra, we can say, you know, well, look, we, we, we can't analyze this because, I mean, there's, there's just too much error in it. But if we do have something that has some error and it's over a broad enough range, we can start picking and choosing where we want to start building our model from. Here's an experimental diffraction spectrum, and it's given by the triangles, and, and I, I should have shown you this. All I've done is I've taken the last guy, and I've broken it down to the interval between roughly zero and a little over one, and I've now labeled these guys with triangles. So this is the same guy that you've seen before, if you just stare at the triangles. Now, I do emissary epsilon machine spectral reconstruction on this experimental diffraction pattern, and this is the resulting... So, first of all, whoa, 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 whoa. let's take... What is this crystal? What is this? You've seen enough to know the answer to that. Sort of, kind of, kind of. Give me a guess. Do, do your best. Sorry? We see this strong peak here that looks like 
this at one half, and we see the smaller one here at L equal one. And if we didn't have any of this other kind of stuff here, and these were just strictly very sharp Bragg peaks, you would say, oh, I've seen that before. That is 2H. That is the period 2, 2 hexagonal. So this looks like naively what you would think. And back in the day, hmm, this looks like a 2H crystal that has some, um, some kind of stacking, some, some where there are regions of the crystal that break the regular stacking sequence of 2H that are somehow disordered, that are somehow broadening these diffraction peaks. And when we do epsilon machine reconstruction, this is what we get. So how do we interpret this guy? We want to now start thinking about what's, this is the answer, by the way. Let me just start right here and say, this is the answer. We calculate things using this. When we say what the stacking structure is for this guy, this is the answer. But if we want to make contact with what we um, intuitively, or not intuitively, but, but, but with what, 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 what kind of stacking structures are important, what we can see is that I have, um, I've written in parentheses underneath the causal state uh, a parenthesis that tells you the probability of being in this causal state. So what we have here is this little piece right here, which we think of as 2H crystal if it were perfectly going back and forth. Here, the probability for, to go from, two, from S2 to S5 is, is um, 0.95, and the probability to go the other way is 0.84, and it spends a lot of time in these two causal states because it has fairly large probabilities then this really does look like there's a lot of structure in there that we would associate with 2H structure. And that starts confirming our intuition. It looks like something that we know before, but we have all these other causal states. Let's look now at this guy over here. Well, this guy over here, there's not much of a chance for it to be in this state. It's only 0.04. It doesn't get here very often, but when it does get here, it stays here for a little while, probably cranks around. So this guy's going to crank out a bunch of zeros in a row, likely, that could do that. This looks like maybe little pieces of 3C crystal. Not many of them, but they're little pieces of 3C crystal that are interspersed. In order to get from the 2H crystal to the 3C crystal, it follows a path like this. So it doesn't just do anything to get there. It actually has to follow a particular path, or this is a particular path that could follow to get there. Of course, it could do something like this, and there's a missing transition here that we could have had, but we do not, and it could do this and then go around, but this is the most likely route. So we have, and we can calculate the probabilities of what kind of when it looks like it's breaking what is the usual periodic structure, we now know how that break occurs and what it looks like. It's not just an arbitrary thing. And we can assign probabilities for each kind of path to get to something over here. Um, 3C structure over here is sort of, this is only 0.5, so maybe not a whole lot, not a whole, but, 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 you know, but some, maybe, maybe you want to call it that. Um, if we look at this guy here and we ask what a path that looks something like this does, well, you remember that this path for a 2H crystal, this looks like what? This deformation fault. It generates the kind of crystal structure we would associate with what we would call a deformation fault. And similarly, this guy here looks like something that would be a deformation fault. These guys, this path, is what we would associate with a growth fault. And there's a similar one over here. And then finally, if we look in, at this type of causal state path, this guy we would associate with deformation faulting. But, 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 but notice, I'm only doing this for convenience. This is the answer, and I'm trying to make sense of what some of these arcs look like and, and, and associate them with faults, but this is really what the structure is. And whether it really is a deformation fault that we see when we see a little bit of crystal like this is not clear, but we know the statistical description of the crystal. Um, let's look at, um, yes, Nikki. Yes, and that kind of symmetry turns out to be important. Um, it turns out that if you think about a 2H crystal, it's completely symmetric. Um, uh, you have this, you know, this is sort of, if you think of a symmetry line that goes right through here, then you have sort of a left and a right half, and 2H is symmetric. Um, so when we look at this faulting, uh, what we're finding is that 
the faulting isn't always symmetric, and you might normally think that it is, because you might think, well, if I heat it, this actually turns out to be an as-grown crystal, but if I annealed a crystal, you might think that, well, the probability of a, of a layer switching, you know, one way to the left or to the right, I mean, you know, it should be the same, so I should end up with something that's symmetric. So the fact that we're seeing something that's asymmetric, it could be somewhat due to um, uh, experimental error in, in, in the spectrum, or it could point to some type of, of physics that's going on, and we really don't know. Well, it also seems like the asymmetry in the machine allows you to have one region of it that, like, just going back to the, like, the old, mm -hmm. like, you know, like, go back and try to make connections with the old fault theory. Mm -hmm. It allows you to have one type of fault over there, and it allows you to have a different type of fault over there, because if the probabilities were the same, you wouldn't have a kind of place on in fact, that's a great observation. Previous descriptions of the fault model, what were people would use, and describe this, we'll talk about in just a second, do not make a distinction between whether, if they, if they want to call it, do not make a distinction between whether a slide occurs at this causal state initiating an extra zero, or whether a slide occurs at this causal state initiating an extra one. Our formalism can pick that up effortlessly. We didn't do anything to make it happen. It just did. And so if there is this type of asymmetry in the spectrum where you might think that there should be some symmetry, we can find it. And in fact, in fact, let's go back just a tiny bit. Uh, that was forward. And look at this. Let's look at another example. Maybe here is the best one to look at. You'll no sorry, maybe here is the best one to look at. You'll notice that these are little um, little bumps right here, and you'll notice that this isn't really quite symmetric as it is on this side. It's a little bit different. I and mean, in fact, these peaks are, are not really terribly symmetric. But, but just looking here, you see that there's a little asymmetry here. It's not much, but it does exist. And it's this kind of asymmetry that's being reflected in the Epsilon machine. So how do we do? So let me just show you the QS correlation functions, which I'll remind you is the probability that two layers separated by a distance of n are the same. And I mean that in the ABC notation. So um, experiment is the, um, the dark uh, squares. And our calculation or our reconstruction is the, um, so the light squares is experiment, dark squares is us, and then the O squares is the fault model. And in fact, you see that we do significantly better for correlation functions than the fault model does. You know, not perfect. Over here, starting roughly in here or so, you can see that we're kind of missing it, that our, uh, 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 our description is predicting smaller oscillations as it approaches an asymptotic value. But, uh, but still here, it's, it's, it's not too bad. The fault model is... is is clearly not as good. Looking at the diffraction spectrum, um, we are we are the solid line. So the experiment again is here. I, I should have had I should have had the key here. Um, we are the dark line, and you can see that. Uh, that the fault model is the dashed line as it comes down. And in particular, you can see that here, the fault model is predicting, their description is predicting that it goes to zero nicely, but actually the experiment shows a little bump here. We get the bump. They don't. Um, over here, this kind of is a little bit of a broader shoulder. And again, the fault model is kind of missing that. And we really kind of catch that also. So we're really picking up additional structures that have been missing in previous description. We don't do as well over here. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it turns out this peak we, we, we don't quite get as well. Um, but, we, but we get a, a fair amount of the, the, the structure, you know, as, as far as looking at the diffraction pattern right. Um, this is the epsilon machine. I just wanted to have that up there so to show you again. And then finally, I want to make contact with the previous description. The experimentalist who measured this said what we have is a 2H crystal that is, has a faulting probability of 5% or 0.5, which means there's a 0.5 chance at each layer that you'll somehow break the stacking rule of 2H. Well, when we try to break this guy down, we really can't do it in a, in a completely consistent way, but we can make it seem kind of sensible. And if we look at the probabilities of some of these arcs, like this would be a growth fault, and this would be a growth fault, etc. We can sort of, little hand-waving here, not saying it's strict, we can sort of say, well, if we assign those probabilities to arcs and then 
look at how we could distribute them among the faults. We find that the 2H structure is only maybe 83%, and we find that deformation faulting is about 17% of the epsilon machine, and it turns out that if you write down the fault model at, at for 0 0.5, 0 0.05 chance of faulting, it turns out to be about a 16%, uh, sorry, about a 17% density, which, which we, so we agree with the fault model on what the deformation faulting looks like, but we also find growth faults, and we also find 3C structure, and we also find layer displacement faults on this guy, and these had been missed in previous analysis. Now, we would really like to have much better diffraction spectra, but, um, but, it, but, but and, and, and even if some of this is coming from some error in the diffraction spectra, it shows the power that, we're, that we can actually find stuff like this, and we can associate it with kinds of stacking stuff that we know about. Um, I'm almost out of time, so let me just go um, quickly, I have another spectrum that I've analyzed, and um, the triangles again are experiment. And just to sort of stab myself in the eye a little bit, these little wiggles here are going to be, this dark line is going to be uh, what we calculated, and these little wiggles in here are actually not, uh, a, are, are not physically meaningful. They're due to how I calculated the um, how I calculated this diffraction pattern, and, and, and Paul's work is going to allow us to completely eliminate some of these little little things that, 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 that aren't so good. But anyway, so this is what the diffraction spectrum looks like, the triangles. And um, these are the correlation functions. Again, the epsilon machine does a lot better in picking up the correlation functions. You can see that the squares, light and dark, tend to be on each other much more, and the fault model, again, doesn't do as well. Um, when we look at the diffraction spectrum, we find that the fault model really kind of misses this peak a lot. I mean, it goes way up here when it doesn't do that. We do a bit better in, in getting this guy. We also get this broadband diffuse scattering in between these two peaks, which the, uh, which the fault model really doesn't get so well. Uh, we both turn out, though, to miss this right here. And that is probably because in order to get this, we need to go to R equals 4. I'm pretty sure that this is due to some kind of 6H structure that we can only see if we can differentiate it from some other structures. Uh, I can explain to you the reasons why, but if I think if we go up one more R, we'll catch this guy. But we do considerably better. Um, and then finally, so here's the epsilon machine again. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. No, look, no, look, no, look. Don't look. No, let's see the epsilon machine. What kind of crystal is this? You know enough. What is it? This is how it used to be done. You've, you've, seen what, you've seen what perfect crystals look like. Which perfect crystal does this boast look like? Two. Sorry? 2H mm, two has the peaks at L equal 0 and L equal a half, or minus a half since it's periodic. So I don't really see a lot of action here. So I'm not thinking 2H is important here. 4H, 4H would be something at a quarter, which would be here, and a half, which I'm not seeing much of here, and point, minus 0.75 at the same here. So I'm not thinking 4H is important here either, intuitively. Just, just looking at it, I mean, this is all for the back of the hand, intuitively. Sorry? Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. So we see something right here. This is about at a third, and this is about minus a third. So we really want to think about period three. What has period three? Three C. Sorry? Say it, say it loud because I'm deaf. Three C. Three C, exactly. And we see both of these peaks. So naively, when you look at this value, you say, well, this looks like it is a crystal that half of it maybe is, this corresponds to the. Um, zero, so maybe half of this crystal is, uh, there's a lot of zeros giving me the 3C minus, and this would be 3C plus. So it looks like I have that, and I have a lot of disorder between that are, that are somehow connecting them. In fact, this crystal began life as a 2H crystal. It was tortured in an oven at 600 degrees centigrade for a while, and it did its very level best to try to transform to the stable configuration, which was 3C, but it didn't make it because of the fact that, that it's, it's, it's hard to move a modular layer, and once part of the crystal starts to try to go one way, and another part goes another way, and so you know the regions of 3C don't match up. 
So, so that's the history of this guy. And if we look at the um, Epsilon machine, does it conform to what we think? Okay, well, spends a lot of time in S0. This is, three C, this is what we think of when we think of 3C structure. Spends a lot of time over here in S7. We think of this as 3C structure. So that part looks right. What about the 2H structure? Is there any 2H structure here? Well, in order to get 2H structure, I need to see something that goes back and forth. In fact, this epsilon machine makes a definitive prediction. This epsilon machine says that the 2H structure that whatever was in this machine has been completely obliterated because there's no way I can get any series that goes 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. It makes a definitive prediction that the, three, that the 2H structure is gone. Um, it looks like this is, um, it looks like the, this guy right here, this just follows the path and usually goes over here and then this stays here and then it'll rattle. And interestingly enough, it doesn't follow the symmetric path back that we saw here as much, but it takes and follows this little path with, um, you know, uh, 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 even though this is a typo because this has to be a one. <laughs> bad student, bad, bad, bad. This is a one, and so it follows this path actually more often than it follows this path. So, in fact, it actually gets back differently when it oscillates between the two crystal structures. Ooh. Ch, ch, ch. Um, so, even looking at the epsilon machine, even though we're going to argue that we can't sensibly um, make this, um, put this into um, a, a sensible fault structure, um, what we can argue is that we can get a lot of intuition and a lot of insight out of this guy. I, I think it probably is in the published paper, too, Jim. I hope it isn't. Um, so we don't really think there's a good way to think about a, a fault analysis here. A um, couple more slides and I'm done. One is that we can calculate from the Epsilon machine, we can calculate physical quantities that you have, have um, been aware of. Um, this is the order of the Markov process. And we find that for these reconstructed machines, we had to go to R equals 3, which is third order Markov. We're able to calculate what the stacking entropy is. And we're also able to calculate what the complexity is needed to describe these guys. And I'll give you some comparison with other structures. And although I haven't uh, talked about it, given what the actual structure is, you can calculate what the energy difference should be between um, different planes that are stacked differently. And when you do that, uh, you can turn, it turns out that you can calculate the energy for an arbitrary stacking, which is what we do. And what we find out is that, not surprisingly, for the, for the lowest energy state at zero temperature, it turns out that this uh, 135 has an energy stacking per little pair of um, zinc sulfide. It's about minus 0.2. The smallest it can have is, point, uh, is minus 1.2. 7, 9. So it's trying to get down there, but it doesn't quite make it. Um, and this guy actually turned out to be not too far from the 2H. So we can calculate these things. I mean, that's... I don't want to hit this too much. I'll just let you look at this in the, um, in the notes. But here are the three kinds of, uh, of faulting models that we talked about earlier or ways that I can think of it. Um, I would just argue that emissary has some significant advantages. We don't need to just look at the peak analysis like the fault model does. And we don't just fit a diffraction spectrum. Um, we can treat any amount of disorder. And in principle, this guy can't because he insists on having a, fault, a, a parent structure, a parent faulting structure. And we don't. Uh, a unique description. I would argue that the Epsilon machine, even though we can't break it down into something that we, that we have... Um, even though we can't break it down into uh, something that looks at the fault model uh, in all cases, that's really the problem with the fault model, not us. We end up with a unique description of what it is. How it got there is a different question. Um, we all assume this is, I'm pretty sure that this also assumes a Markov process, but it's a little bit fuzzy to tell, but there, I have reasons to believe that. Um, we can have uh, simultaneously more than one crystal structure. We don't make any distinction between fault structure and crystal structure. None. 
absolutely none. There is no distinction between them. That is really kind of cool. We, have, we now have a big umbrella that treats disordered structures and ordered structures all the same. All the same. This is very nice. We use all the information in the diffraction pattern because we integrated over an entire interval in L, whereas previous descriptions did not, and we can calculate physical properties. Um, I think I've just said all of that, but here it is summing up. This turns out to be there turns out to be a lot of things that one can do. And let me just mention some of the possible um, open research questions. So this is really an, an active field of, of research. It, we would like it to be more active, but it, it is active. Um, what Nikki was talking about with um, symmetry conditions, we can actually impose the symmetry conditions directly on the equations for emissary. And that turns out to be possible because we think a lot of crystals are pretty symmetric. Um, we can tell that by the diffraction spectrum. Um, we can extend these to the R equals 4 case, which is perfectly doable. Um, we can also use a reverse Monte Carlo to find disordered crystals, to, um, to uh, find sequences which would give the appropriate diffraction spectra, and then do a um, machine reconstruction on that sequence. That's also something that one could look at. Um, we need to simulate some more of these different kinds of uh, vaulting uh, mechanisms to have a better idea of, of what the Epsilon machines look like. We want to consider additional materials. Um, we want to consider the implications of disorder on condensed matter systems on material properties, such as Anderson localization, which disorder tends to localize some electrons around the disorder. And this can lead to some interesting physical effects that could be, that could be actually relatively important and people are thinking about. Um, and then there are other other possibilities. The final one I'll mention at the bottom is, is that notice we, everything we did today was one-dimensional. We really, really would like to look and think about this in a two-dimensional setting. And so there's, there's, some, there's some definite theoretical lifting here that needs to be done, but um, this would be really nice. So if anyone is interested. And finally, if you want to read more about this, um, these, are, these are some um, references.